Well, I have been excited uh, about this service for a little while when I decided we were going to kind of uh, hit a little bit of a pause. Uh, this week, we are going to do something extremely different than we, what we normally do. And then next week, I have a friend. His name is Dave, uh, born in the Congo. His dad pastored, was a missionary in the Congo. He now is a youth pastor in the area, and he is going to be here next Sunday preaching as I'm gone on men's retreat. Uh, it is going to be great. You're going to love Dave. I hope you'll be here in support of him and what he's doing. But I believe that God is going to challenge you as he speaks on, on Sunday. And so I hope that you'll join us. Uh, but this week, we're going to do three things that I think are s significant to the life of the church. Uh, if you're new with us, maybe you're here and you're like, I don't really know if I believe. I think this is a great week for you to be here. An opportunity for you to hear what we see is most important. We talk about a lot of things, uh, but we're going to talk about what we really believe is most important to us as as the church. And these three things are, we're going to talk about the role of the church and specifically as members or partners. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, we're going to participate in communion in, in a different way than what we normally do. And, and then we're going to celebrate with three young people who are deciding to commit their lives to follow Jesus and, and do that publicly, to confess that publicly uh, through baptism. And so it's going to be a great service, but it's going to look different. They're going to be kind of in chunks. And so uh, maybe you're excited. I won't do a normal 30 minute or roughly 30 minute uh, sermon today. Uh, there'll be shorter teachings on each one of these things. Uh, we've discussed often uh, that the, the word church in the scriptures does not mean a building. Uh, we, we often err on that side and we'll say things like, uh, we're going to church and I push back on that and we don't go to church. We are the church, right? We've, some of you have heard this multiple times, but this is so important to me that you that you get this. Uh, if you remember this thing, I didn't grow up in church, but even I knew this as a kid, right? Uh, here's the church, right? It's this, this building. Here's the steeple and what you open it and there's all the people, right? And so I pushed back on that and I said, here's the church, right? That sometimes meets in a building and maybe sometimes there's a steeple, right? Not even all the time there's a steeple, but, but the important part of that is for you to begin to see and to understand that we are the church, it's not a place that we gather because if you didn't know this, there are churches gathering right now, not in typical buildings, typical church buildings, that there are people around the world right now meeting in basements in fear, that they don't have the luxury of meeting in a building that we call a church. And so it's important for you to see that the church is made up of us. And then there's some people who, who would say and decide that they want to be a member, what we've often said, a member of the local church. Now around here, we begin changing the terminology of that. Uh, we have begun saying that you become a partner with the local church, not just a member. Uh, when uh, I used to work out, or I at least had a little card on my keychain, you've heard me say this if you were in Trinity 101, I carried a card, and some of you have this card uh, that gets you into Gold's Gym or a, a fitness place, right, where you can work out. And if you're like me, oftentimes it just becomes a card that you carry uh, if you're not very disciplined or make the time. Uh, I have a card that says that I am a member somewhere, right? And whenever I want to show up, as long as I've paid my bills, whenever I show up, they owe me something. I have expectations of them because I have paid and I'm, I'm coming for a service, something that I need. Or if you have a membership at Costco, and, and the only reason I like to go with my wife is for the free samples, um, but you have a membership to Costco or to Sam's, there is this expectation. Or American Express, for a long time, their slogan, I don't know if this is it anymore. Does anyone know what it was? Yeah, membership has its privileges. And I think for a long time, the church has kind of erred. And we've kind of functioned in that same way. And we've seen membership in the church as something that I'm going to expect something because maybe I'm here every week or I tithe and those things are really important. But in membership, there is this expectation that I think is not really scriptural or biblical. See, being a partner in its definition means that you share in its ownership. If you're a partner somewhere, you are sharing in the ownership of that organization or that business or for us, the church. It means you take responsibility, that you're fully buying into the purpose of the organization. 
uh, when I talk about this, when, when people take Trinity 101, and, and some of you have taken that with me, I use the analogy between a cruise ship and a battleship. Uh, I've never been on a cruise, but I know enough people who, who have that when you go on a cruise, you really get to do whatever you want to do. No one's going to make you do anything, right? You eat when you want to eat as much as you want to eat. You pull up to an island. If you want to get off, you get off. If you want to stay on, you stay on. You sleep when you want to sleep, right? You, you're, you are expecting something from that ship. But a battleship, uh, my, my dad is a uh, Marine, uh, served in the Vietnam War and doesn't talk a lot, but there is this idea in the military uh, that everyone knows the expectation that is put on them, that they have fully bought into the mission, that they all play a role, that they are important to getting accomplished what they are supposed to do. And on a battleship specifically, everyone is together. They know where they're headed and they know what they need to do. And so we need to function less as a cruise ship and more with the idea that we are all on the same mission together and we all play a significant role. Scripturally, what does this look like? Uh, we're going to look at Acts 4. Um, there's a lot of these passages we could look at. I just want to reference a couple of these. Uh, Acts 4, uh, 1 through 4. If you don't own a Bible, there should be a red Bible in front of you somewhere. Uh, please take that. That's our gift to you. That's the page number for that uh, passage. It says this. It says, The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They're speaking about Jesus. It says, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Peter and John are going around talking about what they had heard and what they had experienced in their own lives. That there was this hope that they had here and now, but also they believed because Jesus had gone to the cross and died, buried and come back, resurrected, that we have hope in resurrection as well. And so they're, they're telling people about this. It says they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. They're jailed because of what they're talking about. But then there's this verse, verse 4, that, that you could miss because uh, we, we think about someone sacrificing for what they believe in and going to jail. But it says in verse 4, but many who heard the message believed. In the midst of persecution, they still preach, and there's people who believe. And it says the number of men grew to about 5,000. There is this idea that in that moment, the church begins to gather. And it's so important. They're like, okay, one, two, three. They're counting the number of people who have given themselves to the message of Jesus. They're paying attention to those. It's not just by chance. It's not just something you rub shoulders with every once in a while. It was so significant, they begin counting the number of people who believe. And then just on down from that, verse 32, it says, all the believers were one in heart and mind, and they were united in the mission. They were connected for one reason. It says, no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything that they had. They saw one another as a community that they were connected to just not a service or a building that they went to. They were one in mind and even in body. And then if you were to read Romans 16, this won't be on the screen, I won't read it, but the end of Romans, Paul's writing this letter and then he begins naming all these people. It was like so significant that he wanted to name the people who were having a significant impact on the local church there in Rome. He begins thanking them and calling out what they are doing. It is significant in Acts as the church begins to gather to pay attention to those things. And so we have some people today who have said, look, it's been great coming and being a part of Trinity, but there's something that we want to connect ourselves to more, that we want to partner with the mission of Trinity. And here's the deal. Uh, they're not only joining the local church, but they're joining a global church. Uh, we're we're going to baptize uh, Mia here in a moment, and, and you'll hear her story a little more, but Mia is from Germany and she's going to be going back to Germany next summer. And I already know a pastor who is doing significant things in Germany that I'm going to try and connect Mia with. We are not on our own. We are a part of a global church, over 2 million uh, people who are a church of, in the church of the Nazarene, our network of churches in 162 different world Areas. And so as these friends come and join Trinity, they are really joining a global church. This is not even just about us. And as they come and we, we, we think about the, the term member, we think of it usually only about belonging to a group. But here's where in the scriptures, 
we see member differently. It really is about a part of or an organ of the body, especially a limb. Listen to this. Paul's writing to a church in Corinth and he says this, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20. It says, the body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot says, should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. You, you play a significant role, whether you're a member or a partner or not. If you gather here, if you call yourself a part of Trinity, you are important to what we're doing. You play a significant role in the life of Trinity. And here's what I want to encourage you with today. And we just spent two weeks looking at the, the topic of loneliness. There are no individual Christians. That is as far from scripture and biblical as it could possibly be. There is not this idea that we are individualistic in our faith. We are connected in what we believe. And so as someone comes forward and says, I want to be a member in this way, they're saying that I know I'm a part of the body. And not only that, but I want to emphasize with those and with you that you are important to what we are doing. That you may feel like your gifts are less than someone else, but they're not any less important. I coach soccer, and we've talked about that, and my son's team, uh, we're 5-0, and oh, not that I'm counting or that it matters that much, but we have not lost uh, a game yet. Uh, but one of my little boys is really, really good, like really good. I'm hoping he stays with us and doesn't go play on a, a club team. Really, really good. He scored over half of our goals. And, and I, was, I picked him up the other day to take him to our game, and he, he often talks about how good he is, right? And he made this statement about how he wasn't sure uh, we'd be undefeated if it wasn't for him right? And in the back of my mind, I'm like, maybe you're right, but I got to use this as a teaching moment, right? And I, and I said to him, really? So I wonder if you played tonight on your own, how we would do? Like, do you think you could go score and play goalie? Do you, do you think you could pass it to yourself and go score? And he began to think, and I began to challenge him, and I, what I was saying to him and what I would say to you is he is not enough on his own. He's not enough on his own. You and I, we need one another. But more importantly, God has called us as the church, as the body, to have a significant impact on the people around us and in our community. You play a significant role in what God is doing. Be being in the church doesn't save you. Even being a partner or a member of the church doesn't save you. That's Jesus alone. But partnering with the church, those who are saying that today, allows God, even in more of a way, to say, that your giftings are a part of the body, that they are the benefit of others, and it creates an opportunity for you and others to mature in our faith. So as I preach every week, look, I go home sometimes, and I think, man, I could have said that differently. I hope they heard what I was trying to communicate. I think, man, I, if I preach that again, I could do better. But these two things are not based on me. Um, these two things really are not based on you, and they are based completely on who God is and what he has done on our behalf. And that is communion and baptism. Both of these are ways that we recognize the presence of God being in our midst. We talk about how everywhere you go, God is near to you. And, and that is important. We, we've talked about that for the last few months. As we talk about suffering, as we talk about hurt and pain, that no matter where you are, God is with you. He is near to you. But there's something about gathering together, about collectively recognizing the spirit of God being with us, and then there's something even more significant when we participate in communion and baptism. Communion is this moment, both of these things really, where we recognize the mercy and the grace of God. I heard a story this week about a little boy uh, who told, this is, not, uh, this is not my little boy, uh, but I heard a story about a little boy uh, who told his dad, I'm not going to do what you told me to do. Uh, so if you're a parent, you might have had that moment in your life. 
And so you, you take a moment, hopefully you take a, a breather, and he sent his son up to his room. And he said, go to your room, I'll be there in a moment. And he sends him off, and in anger, the, the dad's trying to think, okay, what's the consequences, what, what is the punishment going to be? And so the father spends a few moments to figure those things out, and he makes his way to his son's room. And he opens the door, and he finds his son sitting on the bed, and his eyes are filled with tears. And he says to his dad, Dad, please don't discipline me. Uh, please don't give me what I know I deserve. I know I was wrong and I know I deserve punishment, but would you not do that today? And what this little boy was asking for, although he may not have known, was asking for mercy. And so we use these words a lot, mercy and grace, and, and maybe you don't know what they mean, but mercy is withholding a consequence or a punishment that someone deserves. When you're merciful to someone, it means you are holding back that maybe they deserve something, but you decide not to. And that is what has happened and we believe happens with God. That God is a merciful God. That there are things often that we deserve in our life, but because he is merciful, he does not give them to us. So the dad thinks about it and without saying anything, he walks out of the room and into his own room. And he goes and on his desk, he has a jar full of coins and he grabs some coins out of the jar and his wife begins to ask what he's doing. And so he begins to proceed to tell her about what has happened with their son. And he says to her, I'm taking him to go buy him ice cream. I'm taking him to buy him ice cream. And she says, that's grace. See, grace is giving something to someone that they don't deserve. This forgiveness and this love. And so we often sing about and we often talk about the grace of God. And that is this grace that we don't deserve, that we could never earn, that we couldn't work hard enough to, but God freely gives to us. And in communion, it is a beautiful picture of that. It is the picture of God sending his son Jesus to a cross for you and for me because he is merciful and he is full of grace. Jesus, in really the last moments of his life and, and with his closest followers, we find in Luke 22, uh, he says this, this happens. Verse 16, it says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then we see after Jesus goes to the cross and he dies, that the early church would often do this. They would regularly, when they would gather together, they would participate in communion, the Lord's Supper. And there's a couple reasons I, I think that that happened. I think in the midst of what they were doing, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of not knowing what was going to happen next, this is what kept them unified. This is what kept them on mission. This is what kept them believing in the good news, the grace and mercy of God. Because every time they went to the table, they remembered and it wasn't just a, a, a nonchalantly remembering what God has done. No, no, no. It was a reminder of what God had done in a deep sense that they did not want to forget or get too far away of the, from the grace and the mercy of God. And so they would continually do it. And for us, I think it's become often so sporadic that we forget it, that, that we have not relied on this. That this grace, this means of grace, the way that God shows up in our life through this. And it is a reminder that it's not something that we earned. That it's not even something that we take from God. And so we're going to do this differently today. Uh, normally when we uh, participate in communion with one another, you'll come forward and someone will hold the bread and you will take it out of the bowl. And then you will dip it in a cup and you will receive it. And, and through watching and observing uh, in a couple other settings I was in and talking with Kristen, our youth pastor, um, kind of come to this realization that we don't take it. We, we, don't, we don't take the grace from God. We, we receive it as a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says this, 
For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is a good gift. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And so this morning, you're going to come forward, and someone is going to take the bread, and they are going to hand it to you. And, and you can't see it, but we have some hand sanitizer back here. So if you already begin to think about that, uh, we will make sure everyone is sanitized before uh, handing you your bread. Uh, but just don't, don't miss the moment. Don't miss the significance of all you have to do is hold out your hands. You, you'll hold out your hands and someone is going to give you the bread. And they're going to say, the body of Christ broken for you. And all you have to do is receive it. It is nothing you can earn and nothing you can do. And you'll receive the bread. And then you'll step over and someone will have a, a little cup of, of juice. And they will hand you the juice and you will take the juice. Uh, but you will not take the elements at that point. You will not eat the bread or the juice. You will go back and sit down. Because also this morning, we want to celebrate this idea that, that it is communion not meant to do as individuals, but collectively as a whole. That we remember together the grace of God and the mercy of God. This is not about doing by yourself, but us doing together. Now let me tell you this. Uh, we, we believe in what is called an open table. Uh, meaning that you don't have to be a member or a partner at Trinity to come and to participate and receive communion this morning. That you don't have to be baptized already to come and to receive communion this morning. All you have to do is want to come. Like the beautiful thing of God's grace is that he allows you to decide. For you to choose to accept it into your life. And so maybe today that would be you. Maybe you hear Ephesians, this grace that we could be saved just by believing. Just by accepting it into our lives that is a great picture of the grace of God. And so once you've had the elements, you will go back and you will wait, and I will give you further instructions. And so there's going to be four stations. Uh, there'll be two here at the front and two in the back. You can just kind of go to the closest place uh, and receive the elements. Again, uh, don't rush through it. Someone will look at you as they hand the bread and say, the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Take that and then go and be seated. And then I'll give us some further instructions. And so if those who are serving uh, will come forward and help pass out uh, the elements to those serving. And then as that's happening, I'm going to, uh, to pray for us. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm thankful for the grace and your mercy that you extend to us that it is a free gift that you give. I, I pray as we uh, celebrate communion this morning, Lord, that it wouldn't just be something uh, we take lightly, um, that it would be a deep reminder of what we believe, and that as a community that we exist because of your grace and mercy. Uh, Lord, I pray for my friends here today who maybe for the first time will be receiving communion. I pray that they would get the deep sense of your spirit in this, that yes, it is bread, and yes, it is juice. But there is this holy mystery, God, that I believe in. That we know that you are near to us in this moment. God, I pray for my friends who maybe uh, today would say they want to believe for the first time. Would you encourage them just on their own uh, to receive your grace? To acknowledge their need for you? And that they would celebrate that by receiving communion. And then God, for many of my friends who who maybe in these moments uh, begin to think about their own life. Maybe they begin to even question if they deserve it. Maybe there's been things that have happened and they're not sure they're welcome because of what has happened in their lives. And Lord, I pray that there would be a deep sense of your love this morning. That this table is what binds us together. It is what binds us to you, God. That all are welcome at the table. Would you encourage them this morning? Pray this in Jesus' name. So God instituted communion, but he also instituted baptism. Jesus himself was baptized, and then he gave instructions to his early church. Go and make disciples. Uh, go and help other people be learners of his way, to believe and to follow. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is in this moment where someone says, 
I publicly believe. I believe in who God is and what he has done in my life, and it is an opportunity for us as the church to celebrate and support those who have made that decision. This water is uh, significant, and it is a sign of something that has happened and that we have been made clean. So those being baptized today will go into the water as a way of showing that their sins have been washed away, that they are a new creation. Uh, Listen to this from David in Psalm 103, 6 through 12. This is in the message version. It says, God makes everything come out right. He puts victims back on their feet. He showed Moses how he went about his work, opened up his plans to all of Israel. God is sheer mercy and grace. Not easily angered, he's rich in love. He doesn't endlessly nag and scold, nor hold grudges forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as heaven is over the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. And as far as sunrise is from sunset, he has separated us from our sins. Baptism today will be a symbol and a sign and a means of grace for that scripture, a way that we recognize God being near to us even as we're in the water. So my friends that are going to be baptized today, I'll ask you to go ahead and move uh, back and uh, go ahead and get changed. Their families will go Uh, with them. And if you haven't been here before, each one of them have written something significant to them in their own words, the reason why uh, they want to be baptized. And those will be read, so we'll enter into the water. Alan will read those. I will baptize them. And then scripturally, there's something that happens when um, they talk about the lost being found. When when someone comes to recognize grace and then publicly confess, um, there is a party in heaven. There is this idea that the angels rejoice uh, when, when that happens, when someone acknowledges and receives that grace in their lives. And so we will celebrate. Each time someone comes out of the water, uh, we will celebrate the decision that they've made. And I don't know, maybe today uh, you haven't been baptized. Uh, and this is maybe even a moment where you would say, man, I've always thought about being baptized. I just haven't done it. Uh, maybe today's that day. And I know you didn't bring anything. I, I brought a couple extra towels. Uh, it may not be enough. Uh, you, you might feel like you'll wait till next time. But maybe in this moment, if there's this strong idea that you want or need to be baptized, you are welcome to do that. Uh, Greg and Abby are going to come and, and lead us uh, in a song. They're going to play a song for us. You guys can go ahead and come. Um, if that's you today, just slip out. I'll be in this hallway over here in a few moments. Uh, if you've decided, hey, you know what? That, that's me. Uh, I want to be baptized today. Uh, You can meet me over there and we'll figure out the details. But I think it's more important for you to recognize God speaking to you and the grace in your uh, lives. And so I'm going to pray for us once again, um, and then I will uh, move out. Uh, They're going to sing a song. The words to this are a great picture of grace and how God sees us and uh, a way to celebrate what's going to happen in the water. God, thank you for these moments. Once again, I thank you for uh, these three young people. who who have recognized the grace um, that you are extending in their lives. Each one of them with a very significant story, all three very different. Uh, Those who have been blessed to be in the church for a long time, and then Mia, who this is new to. Uh, Lord, we, we celebrate all three of them today. I pray this in Jesus' name.